lastly, we have Group H. We've arrived at the very end. The eighth group in this tournament consists of Portugal, Ghana, Uruguay, and South Korea. Obviously, our predictions was it was going to be Italy beating North Macedonia, yeah. playing, playing against Portugal, who would go on to beat Turkey. We got the Italy one wrong. Italy should have won it. They had the chances. I think Berardi had 30 out of the 32 shots at Italy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, Berardi was just off that day. North Macedonia played very, very well. Now they had the perfect and game plan for, it was, for what they yes. could do. Perfect. They had perfect game plan, yeah. Tchaikovsky with a banger, something you dream of. Literally the perfect game plan where you just sit in, you're aggressive, you go forward with one, two guys when you can, and you get a goal. Literally worked to perfection. Velkowski was on one that night at the center back position. It was a perfectly played match for North Macedonia. Yeah. Italy crash out. And the Italians are in tears. And it is what it is. North Macedonia go to that playoff final where they play Portugal, who started off buzzing against Turkey. And it was the exact start that I thought we would see Portugal have in the sense that they have the talent. They have the players. They're in front of their home crowd yep. against, I would say, a weak Turkish side. So just pop off. And they did for the first, let's say, 30, 40 yep. minutes. Second half, though, they're a penalty away from it being a tie game. And that's why Portugal are here in the first place. That's why they were in this playoff spot, because they just dropped points when they weren't supposed to. And if uh, Yilmaz makes that penalty when he's supposed to... Portugal are all of a sudden in a really sticky situation. They're in a pickle. It would have been 2-2, and who knows oh, what would have happened yeah, after yeah, that, yeah. man. That, that momentum would have shifted. That like would crazy. Different story. A completely different Maybe story. Maybe they do get the result, but still, they, they would have to dig deep to get that result. Exactly. So Portugal, despite how well they, how well they started against Turkey, they let themselves go completely in that second half. And for me, that was very concerning because yeah. I was like, oh, Jesus. I always feel that when it comes to Portugal, I'm left wanting, like, can I see Portugal just dominate a World Cup game? <laughs> I know. Like, bro, the, the <laughs> talent they that they have been given, <laughs> yeah. the depth that they have, they have players playing in not just the biggest league, but in the biggest teams, yeah. generational players, generational talent. Give me that. Can you give me that dominant showing that I would expect from a team of this of this stature. That's their key going into this World Cup is can they do that? Because if they don't, it's just going to be a repeat of every single Portugal performance we've ever seen in this tournament. Absolutely. And it's frustrating because over the course of 90 minutes, Portugal will go through so many different phases. There's times yeah. when they dazzle and they're, they're amazing to see. You're just like, who's going to score? What's going to happen? This is incredible to watch. And then there's <laughs> and then there's moments where you're just like, Jesus Christ. Christ, <laughs> defend. Yeah. yeah. We do get good moments. Like, we, we saw Jota make an incredible header and score. Bruno Fernandes had a really good couple of games. Yeah. Octavio Dude. stood out and had a great Octavio, run. man. Dude, honestly, <laughs> I, I, want, I think probably one of the biggest positives out of this playoff round was the inclusion and impact of Octavio. Brazilian-born, now Portuguese through naturalization citizenship. He is the perfect utility midfielder yeah. that you could ask for. Yeah, the janitor, he, man. He, he yes. cleans up he that team. He cleans up, dude. If you need him to attack, he can attack. You need him to play on the wing, he can play on the wing. You need him to go central and distribute, he can go central and distribute. You need him to do some defensive work, he can track back and yeah. defend. Dude, he is, for me, the ultimate utility player. He's been working hard for the past five years at Porto. Year after year, getting better and better as the team itself has progressed. As a just personal Otavio fan, <laughs> I'm so glad that he's finally in this 11. And it looks like Fernando Santos is going to keep yeah, him there because no, honestly, they need him. Yeah, they they need him they there. Need him. Other than that, the chemistry between the, the rest of that offense, it's sporadic. Yes. At best. Yes. And you, I just feel like with what they have at hand, you would expect it to be consistent, to be something that you would almost rely on. Yeah. And it's just not that. No. Ghana. 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 Yeah. <laughs> you see how they got here? You see how it, you, it was, what, <laughs> two, three weeks ago at this same table that we said that, or you said uh, especially, yeah. that if Ghana were to win their match up against Nigeria, you would question everything you know about your ball knowledge yeah. because it just doesn't add up. It, it just doesn't, doesn't make sense up. for Ghana to make it to the World Cup. Three weeks later, they defeat Nigeria off of away goals. Yes. And they find themselves now in this World Cup group. And... 
I, I love it. First of all, <laughs> I absolutely love the football gods giving me, you know, they're testing me. Yeah. Uh, that's how I see this. <laughs> Similar to how Italy lost to North Macedonia, I think Nigeria, they're, the, they're their own enemies here. They created so many chances and they even got a goal in that second mm -hmm. leg to really propel them through it. And the goal that they let in was just, it was just a banger from Partey. Yeah, yeah. And there's nothing you can Caught do. by surprise. But they had so much time to respond. Try they did, but ultimately it amounted to nothing because they just got in their heads. They were making the wrong passes, making the wrong final decisions. They didn't have their shooting boots on. And in front of that crowd, the pressure was simply too much. And that's the thing about international soccer, man. Sometimes it can make you to really high highs. Yeah, and sometimes yeah. that pressure can ring you way down. Credit to Ghana for just sticking into the tie getting those goals that they needed and just ultimately qualifying yeah, yeah. for a goddamn World Cup. A little bit of that hope and faith has been transferred over to Ghana now, who has surprised me because for a while I thought this Ghana side was one of the most lifeless and hopeless teams out there. I, I really, I don't want to, I hate being mean. I hate being negative. Um, it's just not in my personality. But you got to think about who are going to be the weaker teams at this tournament. For me, Ghana is going to be at the bottom of that barrel. I think so. Just the way that they play football, there's not a lot to kind of be enamored with. There's not a lot to be excited about. I, I guess one positive I can give them is that they are organized, right? That can take you so far. In this case, you couple organization with a bit of br individual brilliance because that's what that's what won them this yeah Partey single-handedly got Ghana to this tournament he doesn't score that goal Ghana do yeah. not yeah. go through yeah and it was just it was a goal out of nothing again credit to Partey because he has the skill to do it if they play any other team that has a little bit more conviction yep. in front of goal they probably lose yeah. the game now here's the thing if you're Ghanaian, maybe you're actually in a good, decent group, though. The rest of the group isn't uh, the most solid of teams. We've already highlighted okay. Portugal as being a little uh, right. erratic, a little sporadic in terms of their consistency. Maybe Ghana can take advantage of that. I mean, if you think about Nigeria, they're the definition of sporadicism. Mm -hmm. Not being consistent in front of goal, not being consistent defensively over the course of 90 minutes. If Ghana can take advantage of Nigeria the way that they did, maybe they can do the same thing in this group against teams who don't necessarily have the experience of winning big games of the World Cup. You know, a lot of these players on, these, on this Ghana team, for 12 years, they saw what happened in 2010 against Uruguay. Right. They saw the Suarez handball. They let that simmer into their minds as they progressed through the ranks of their football. 12 years later, they find themselves in the same group being able to avenge the man who, in a way, murdered their father <laughs> <laughs> right Luis Suarez is still plays for Uruguay yep. but the Ghana team is much different now yeah maybe they can find some sort of motivation there some sort of revenge after what could have been a semi-final appearance that definitely will be fuel to the fire if you're Ghana when you play Uruguay not only from a player perspective just but from a fan perspective you're eager for that game to happen if, if, if anything that'll actually work in Ghana's favor because you know they need that right they don't have the skill they don't have the technical ability in every single position to match up against most of these teams yeah. so any extra fuel to inspire them to we'll take it. to outperform yeah. they will take they will yeah. absolutely take yeah. it Uruguay qualified for their tournament after getting third place in Comebol mm -hmm. they ended up besting Ecuador on goal difference so yeah they had a really they good place they had a really good last four or five games yeah no and really they were shaky. efficient yeah, they were shaky to start but kind of like Costa Rica they finished yes. so strong yes and you know we were critical of them when we first started this show because at the time they were not in a yeah, good they had place. no identity at the time yeah. but I but one thing I'll give them now is that they they have at least an identity and roles one yeah. thing I criticized them was that they had no roles especially in the midfield they kind of were just playing generic top quality football yeah. right now they actually have some sort of plan. Diego Alonso has come in, and I think he's he's found his starting eleven. I would say, yeah. And so that that I think has really helped solidify Uruguay to be successful to the point where they are at now. Yeah, and combine that with the rise of Nunez at, at Benfica, Valverde playing quality at, at Real yeah, Madrid, yeah, yeah. Suarez, Cavani, Bentacur at Tottenham, and then Araujo at, at, at Barcelona. Yeah, like, yeah. You know the team is 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 formidable in that sense in terms of positions. I think the biggest thing that's the most important thing for them is momentum. 
I think Uruguay is a team that if they have the right flow behind them, they're capable of amazing things. We saw what happened in 2010 when momentum was on their side. Yes. They win a few games in their group, and suddenly they're fucking firing on all cylinders. I remember that 2010 tournament, that group stage. I saw Uruguay. I was like, okay, they're good, but what more can they give me? Yeah. And once the knockout stage hit, that momentum really kicked in. They got the results they needed in the group stage, and all of a sudden that passion for the sport – every single player realized the position they were in to do something special and they all elevated yes, their performance. Yes. And Uruguay went on to have an incredible rest of the tournament. Yeah. It completely entertained. Diego Forlan, the MVP of the tournament, is incredible. Uh, so I agree. And you could actually say the same thing in 2014. Mm-hmm. They start off a little slow in the group stage with Costa Rica, England, and Italy. They ended strong where they needed to qualify. And then they ended up having a decent knockout stage now obviously they still ended up losing but it was against a really good side they really don't lack quality no. like, you, like that's really not a concern in terms of like matchups almost like a senegal like name for name they can go to they can match up they can pretty match much against up. anybody yeah yeah and so there is that security in that it's just a matter of like when the game comes how will the players perform and, right. and as a unit, how will they tactically dominate their opponent? And just from a personal perspective, it is a little saddening when you think about that this will definitely be Cavani's and Luis Suarez's last yeah. big tournament. Yeah. Just personally, because Uruguay was my first big team that I ever uh, recognized when I first watched the World Cup in 2010. Deo Forlan was my first ever favorite player, if you will. Completely inspired me to learn more about the sport to truly understand what it means to just be a great footballer and to reckon to be able to recognize that right because I pretty soon very early on in my footballing career I recognized that not every player is like Diego Forlan no not every player has that type of skill not every player even touches the ball the same way right he was really able to uh, teach me that like there's so much flair in this sport there's so much beauty, you just, even when it comes to just a simple pass. So I have Diego Forlan to thank, but not only that, the entire Uruguayan squad to thank, just as a country, as a team. When it comes to offensive strikers, some of the best strikers over the last decade have yeah. been Edinson Cavani and Luis Suarez. It'll be beautiful to see them out in this tournament, but it'll also be a little sad, a bit bittersweet, if you will, because they, they have dominated the European scene goal-scoring-wise for the last 10, 12 years. South Korea qualified in second in the AFC. This is after they had a, you could say, fun 2018 FIFA World Cup, getting a really good win over Germany that (laughs) merged forces between the Mexican people and the South Koreans. I naturally have an affinity for this squad because of that. I thank them very much for their duties in that World Cup. Absolutely, as you should. And they got some talent, dude. I saw their lineup for uh, one of the last games. (laughs) They had an all-back four Plus the goalkeeper that all had the last name Kim. I saw that. <laughs> I saw that. I and mean, I saw that lineup. I was like, yeah, interesting. interesting. <laughs> the closest I've seen that was Espanol's 2018-19 team where they had three Lopez's at the back. Damn. Yeah. That's Spanish as hell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they had five Kims back there. And I guess it worked because they've been getting results. And it's kind of the same story for South Korea as it is most World Cups. They've always been able to get to the World Cup. Yes. But can they elevate themselves? Mm -hmm. That's what I ask of them. Because in 2018, they get placed in a group with Germany, Mexico, and Sweden. And they don't qualify. Now we see them in the same situation with, with these squads. And I'm just like, I don't know. I was trying to like calculate. Like what needs to go right for South Korea to be able to finally break that threshold from when I'm formulating, I just don't think there's enough. It's so hard to gauge South Korea's level, if you will. Because, you know, if you finish top of the group in, the, in your AFC, then you're at least at some sort of level. You, you know, you can compete against most teams. Korea wasn't even able to do that against Iran. If you're Korean, it's tough to even gauge yourself because... Korea was in such an easy group. Yeah. It was UAE, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq. Iraq, basically n- no hitters. 
These teams aren't going to even scrape you, let alone score a goal against you. So if you're Korean, you can't even gauge that. Your biggest game, you have two big games, and they're both against Iran. That's it. You perform those short, even if you get the win, which I think they were able to get some sort of points mm-hmm. off Iran. How do you ultimately gauge this Korean side? It's very, very tough. And it doesn't help that their past ventures in the World Cup over the last three iterations have all ended in group stage losses. I see a very talented side, but have they really elevated their teamwork, their offense, other than maybe just relying on Son, maybe Hwang Hee-chan? I don't know. If we want to look for something positive, I think it's that there's like an element of surprise and aggressiveness to... AFC squads this year where maybe South Korea can tap into that. Maybe they can catch Portugal on a disappointing day and get either a tie or a victory out of them. Maybe they can do the same with Uruguay as well. Potentially, they're in a situation where they can get out. Yeah, It's more so just in like their mental approach to the game rather than what they have at hand because what they have at hand, I think, just isn't enough. Let's say for the past three, four cycles, you could easily say every time the top two maybe even three teams, is always South Korea and Japan. Mm -hmm. Both of them did not top their group this cycle. You could use that to say that for the first time, both South Korea and Japan no longer have that title as being the best in the region. That pressure to perform is not there. I I remember the buildup for 2014 and 2018, Japan specifically, had such pressure to perform simply because they've dominated the region for so long. So the media tapped into that and they were like, okay, Japan's going to be good. They're going to, they're going to vie for a second first place spot. They're going to come out of the group stage. They're going to do something crazy. Now, I think for the fact that Japan no longer as dominant as they used to be, honestly, same with Korea. You now have these Middle Eastern teams, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Iran up in the north of the Middle East. These new teams are now coming through. So now the media doesn't really know who to, who yeah. to pinpoint. These AFC teams are jumbled because of that. There's no pressure really on any of them to perform. So now they all can kind of just do their own thing. That's one of the things I highlighted about Japan. We, we talked about it. They don't have a superstar anymore. They just rely on their teamwork. Korea is going to be the same way. So can they just use that pressureless approach approach yeah. to, to this tournament to actually just be like, hey, let, let's just play yeah, football. Let's just play football. And yeah. like, let's cause some havoc. Man. Yeah, exactly. Who you got making out of the group? I think there are two clear favorites for this group. It's going to have to be, for me, I'm going to have Portugal at top, Uruguay second. I have the same two teams, but I had them flipped. Flip. Okay. I'm going to go with Uruguay. I like what I saw these last few qualifying rounds. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. And uh, Portugal, I think, still has what it what it takes to, to get that second place. So, for me, it's Uruguay first, Portugal second. Yeah, and, and just to note and to add, not only do I think they're going to finish first and second, but... I like for a lot of the groups I, I I think or at least hope that the third place team could fight for second. I just don't see that happening in this group. Yeah. I don't see either Korea or Ghana having a real chance at that second spot. I don't. Yeah. That's group H. That's where we stand on it. But let us know what you guys think. And yeah. that concludes our group analysis and predictions. An early version of it. We will be back potentially at some point with a even more deep dive into these groups once the tournament gets closer. For now, this is what we can give y'all, and thanks for watching.